Good afternoon to all those in Europe. Good morning to all those across the Atlantic. I'm Javier Ruperez, and this is uh, the Fires Foundation cycle on 40 years of Spain into NATO, and uh, the fact that uh, few days in few days' time the NATO summit will be taking place in, in Madrid. Uh, it was 40 years ago when Spain uh, decided to join NATO, practically to this day. It was May the 30th, 1982. And uh, for Spain, it was a great moment because that was the beginning of our belonging to the West. After 40 years of dictatorship, we had decided to become a full democracy. And that was the first time that uh, democracies considered to be Spain one of theirs. That's uh, a historical moment, a historical moment which has been extremely well received by Spaniards right now. And at the same time, which uh, reflected a situation 40 years ago when, uh, well, there was a cautious uh, relationship between the two sides, between the two blocs, but at the same time, there was a, a reality of some degree of stability, some degree of peace. Spain was well received by the then 15 members. We became the 16 member of the alliance and we've remained a faithful ally all this time. And uh, just to discuss about uh, all these questions uh, within the cycle that is being organized by the FIES Foundation under the direction of President Jose Maria Aznar, we would like to uh, go to what is going to happen right now. What is the world right now, 40 years afterwards? What are we? What is the world? And that's the first question I would like to uh, answer to the first of our uh, guests. Uh, we have two re 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 really uh, significant personalities to talk to, to us. President Jose Maria Aznar, the former president of the, of the Spanish government, and John Bolton, the former uh, national security advisor of the United States. I would like to start with President Adnar. Uh, Mr. President, how is the world today? How do you see the world today 40 years after Spain decided to join NATO? Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of uh, the people that uh, is connected with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ruperez, for your, your introduction. Uh, for me, as uh, my condition as president of uh, Fires Foundation is um, is a uh, is a um, very serious challenge. This um, this initiative to commemorate the 40th anniversary to to Spain of Spain in in, in NATO, because uh, this was was a decision very important for the for our country, and continue to be today a um, uh, um, situation extremely important. Extremely important for the for, for today and for the, the future uh, of our country and the world. But uh, first of all, th let me please the um, uh, thanks to, to Ambassador Bolton. I, I can express my gratitude to Ambassador Bolton. Thank you very much for your participation. I appreciate very much, uh, Ambassador Bolton. You know very well that uh, we are all friends in the. A lot of several several years ago, so obviously several years ago, but we share a lot of views. We share a lot of different initiatives. We share a lot of different battles. A lot, a lot of different concerns. And I don't know. I don't like to contradict and to disobey to our moderator, Ambassador Ruperez. No, but in the condition of our guest, special guest, Ambassador Bolton. The, the first question that Ambassador Ruperez proposed, I, I, I prefer that the, 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 the start of this meeting uh, was in, in, the, in, the, in the words of, uh, of Ambassador Bolton. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Bolton. And, and we, all of us, we like, we like to, to hear from you, your vision of how is the world today? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, and thanks uh, to FaZe for, for putting this, uh, program together it really is quite significant. And I think, uh, uh, as Ambassador Ruperez said, the uh, Spain's joining the NATO alliance marked a significant uh, change for uh, Spain and, and, uh, and, and its participation in, in the wider diplomacy of uh, not just Europe, but the world as a whole. 
uh, and and comment as it did just a few years before the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the break breakup of the Warsaw Pact uh, uh, was was very important as well. You know, it's uh, it's amazing uh, to think that 40 years later, NATO is still uh, a vital and important organization. Many people felt uh, in 1991, 1992 that. Uh, NATO had accomplished its task and, and would disappear, uh, but but it's uh, it's still here today. And indeed, uh, tragically, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, pe- playing an even more important role than than we could possibly have envisioned. I think at the end of the the Cold War, uh, uh, and a lot remains to be considered about what the outcome in Ukraine is going to be. But uh, at this very moment, even though uh, one European leader uh, uh, just a short time ago said that NATO was brain dead, uh, now we see uh, what to me is almost a miracle that Finland and Sweden have requested to join NATO, something that was uh, inconceivable before February the 24th, uh, but which is now uh, essentially uh, a certainty after the, the normal ratification uh, process goes through. Uh, it's another major step forward and, and hopefully uh, another step in, in really trying to secure peace and security in Europe, which was always NATO's main intention. Uh, but of course, the world is bigger than the North Atlantic area and, uh, and we face significant challenges really around the world. I, I think the existential challenge for all of us uh, in the uh, 21st century is China. I think we're slow to realize the nature of the challenge that uh, China's posed, but it's becoming increasingly real in all of our lives. It's not just political or military, it's economic as well. Uh, China has very long-term planning horizons, which is not necessarily an American virtue, that's for sure. Uh, and, and I think things we have to think about, it calls into question what is the West's relationship with those around the Chinese periphery in the Indo-Pacific, with India, with uh, Southeast Asia, with Japan, with Taiwan, Australia. Uh, th- these are very, very important questions for all of us uh, going forward. And I'm reminded all the time of uh, Jose Maria's uh, suggestion, it's 15 or 16 years ago now, that the future of NATO uh, could rest in large part on making NATO a global organization. Uh, you know, in the United States, a lot of people have talked uh, from time to time about their dissatisfaction with the United Nations and said, what we really need is a League of Democracies. Uh, but actually, we do have a League of Democracies. It's called NATO. Uh, and uh, Jose Maria proposed that uh, countries like uh, Japan, Australia, Singapore, Israel, others we could think of uh, might be invited to join NATO. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, very fitting on the 40th anniversary of Spain's joining NATO with Finland and Sweden now about to join, hopefully in very short order. Uh, with this enormous crisis in Ukraine still to be resolved, that uh, it, we've demonstrated that NATO really is, I think, the most successful political military alliance in history. Uh, And yet it still has a very important future, looking at challenges, uh, not simply in the North Atlantic, but really around the world. Um, So I I basically agree with your points. And uh, that's a very, uh, that's very obvious. It's, uh, if we look at what is happening right now, perhaps the only really positive, the only positive up to a point aspects of the, uh, of the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine is precisely to give a new life to the transatlantic relationship. That's a very positive and uh, at the end of the day, it, says it, would be, uh, it would be excellent to have all these NATO alliance uh, getting together with all those democracies around the world. But what is going to happen with uh, Finland and Sweden if we talk about Turkey? Do you think that Turkey will eventually veto the entrance of the well, the, I can tell you that uh, though the situation is completely different, we are we are in the south and they are in the north. But we do understand the reasons why the Finns and the Swedes are asking for to belong to NATO. Do you think that Turkey will eventually veto that uh, possibility? 
No, I, I don't think so. I think uh, President Erdogan is bargaining for something. It's not entirely clear what. He's always upset about one thing or another. I recall uh, when uh, the Secretary General to be uh, Anders Fogh Rosmussen was about to come into office, Erdogan objected on the basis of the famous uh, Danish newspaper cartoons about the uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, he wanted something, and and it was worked out. So I think uh, this is a bump in the road. I, I hope it's only a bump in the road because it would be very self-destructive and and very much not in Turkey's interest uh, to to carry this much further. And I don't I don't think it will be carried much further. Let me let me move, uh, Jose Maria, now President. Let me move from NATO to the United Nations. We are watching right now something which is uh, really terrible. Uh, we are watching how one of the members of the Security Council, one of the five members of the, of the permanent members of the Security Council, one with veto, is violating systematically all the main rules of the international law of the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, how is the United Nations going to react? Which is the United Nations future in this respect, what are we going to? I mean, if if you were a member of the Security Council, a permanent member of the Security Council, would you be sitting down together with Putin whenever you the Security Council would be meeting? Yeah, I understand very well your question, Adolf, but uh, but the problem is that uh, for these kind of questions, uh, different in the past, with these kind of questions. Uh, I don't know. As the, um, would like to say exactly that to me, member of the uh, of the Security Council is irrelevant. But the influence of the Security Council in the current crisis in the world are almost irrelevant. If you look in the intervention of the United Nations, unfortunately, in the current crisis, or the intervention of the or the decision of the of the Security Council in the current crisis practically non exist And you can ask publicly, if non exist in NATO, what happened? What happened? If non exist NATO, in NATO, all aggression is possible in any country. And uh, the United Nations has not the capacity to stop the days. Uh, another question is if you if if, uh, if you can share a sheet in the in the Security Council with a member that, that has um, in violation violation of the United Nations Charter of that invade another country or no respect the sovereignty of the integrity of the country of the country or to provoke a war. I think this is this thing is totally unacceptable. But the situation of the United Nations, taking account the situation of different agencies of the of the of the of the United Nations, some agencies working, another no, some agen uh, some agencies working reasonably, others no. But the situation of the United Nations as institution and the Security Council in particular, but the key element of the United Nations is in this moment, in my view, critical. And this is one of the reasons, one, this is one of the reasons, because the reinforcement and the strengthening of NATO for us, for all of us, and, and, and as well for the world, is totally uh, indispensable. I appreciate very much the, 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 the words of Ambassador Bolton about my reflection and my proposal to extend NATO, to consider NATO for a global organization. But I consider I I I, I keep in <laughs> I keep in this position because I con I consider that the evolution of the world reinforces this idea that the NATO can be an, a global uh, a global uh, a global organization no? and in in a world in a world defining for the consequences of technological revolution and a world that is uh, full. Of, uh, of uh, weapons with uh, capacity of extraction that we cannot imagine in uh, some uh, decades ago or some years ago. In a world um, 
with a serious competition of powers, especially in, in, in some, for some powers, China or Russia, or Iran, in a world that is it's unstable, insecure, in disorder, to have to reinforce our organization with, with NATO is, uh, is uh, very important. If you look in, I, I, have, I, I have a member of that generation that have the privilege that never know a war in, in house, domestic war or uh, general war in Europe. It is true that we are looking the, was the, 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 the war in the Balkans or now in Ukraine, but not the classic wars that we live in in the, in the, the last century. You know? And we are living in an exceptional period, an exceptional period under the umbrella and under the American leadership. This is the truth. American Maybe. leadership is, is challenging now. And now the response will be extremely important for all of us. But in this response, in this angle, as well, the position of NATO, NATO will be key again, again uh, in the future. Let, let me ask you both, uh, in a few days' time, at the end of the month of June, we are going to have the summit meeting of NATO here in Madrid, which is extremely important. It's extremely important because every 10 years, the summit meeting takes place, and certainly this is not any year in particular. This is the year where we are watching the best world situation that we've, we've watched since the end of the Second World War. Do you think that, uh, or do you uh, decide, do you wish, that uh, the summit meeting would eventually consider that enlargement, that global enlargement of NATO all over the place, that uh, it would introduce, it would consider in the strategic concept, the new strategic concept to be applied for the coming 10 years, that possibility of NATO becoming the global uh, institution? Ambassador Bolton. Well, uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, I think, I think this, this very opportune moment to consider a number of, uh, of questions. I, I have a feeling that uh, the temptation of the leaders at uh, the Madrid summit will be to talk about Ukraine and, and Russia, and that's understandable and, and, uh, and probably necessary. But, but I think we could consider, we, we could hope that they consider a number of other uh, broader issues as well. You know, uh, our leaders uh, since February the 24th have talked a lot about how united NATO is. Uh, in fact, we know, sadly, that it's not as united as the rhetoric. Uh, we know that uh, many countries in Europe in particular are uh, still not contributing as much as they could, both in terms of their overall defense expenditures and, and really what they've provided to the Ukrainians. We have uh, disputes within uh, NATO about uh, how to resolve this conflict with the Russians. Uh, we, we heard from President Zelensky a few days ago that President Macron of France had told him that Ukraine had to give up some territory to save face for Putin and end the war that way. We, we don't know exactly what words Zelensky used in response, but we know that he rejected that idea. So so the, 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 the questions of uh, uh, unity among the 30 uh, NATO members now and, and soon to be 32, I think uh, will be important, number one. Number two, the Ukraine crisis in many respects uh, comes from a NATO failure uh, not to address the question of how far it was prepared to expand. You know, when the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union broke up, uh, it's not true, as some people argue, that we push NATO's borders toward Russia. That's, that's inaccurate. Countries of Central and Eastern Europe came to us and said, look, we want security. We want peace. We don't want to be part of something like the Warsaw Pact again. So NATO expanded for very good defensive reasons. But we left a gap. We left a, a gray zone between NATO's eastern border and Russia's western border. Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine are one part of that. The Caucasus countries are another. The Asian republics are another. Uh, we, we looked at this question in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit when President Bush proposed to put Ukraine and Georgia on a fast track for NATO membership. That was rejected. Uh, four months later, the Russians invaded Georgia and, and the, rest, the rest we know. What, what is going to be our position going forward on constituent 
parts of the former Soviet Union that uh, that want to join the NATO alliance. We, we didn't resolve it. And we got 2014, the invasion of Ukraine, number one, and 2022, the second invasion of Ukraine. We, we can't afford to make that mistake again. Uh, and then third, I, I really do think uh, whatever specific countries we may want to consider in Asia and elsewhere in the world, that NATO's part uh, in, in that larger world has got to be considered. You know, in uh, 2019, I think it was uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil said that he wanted Brazil to join NATO. Uh, now that didn't go very far, but it's a, it's a, it was a certainly a very interesting suggestion. Uh, uh, and I, I think that if we, uh, if we ignore these, uh, this global issue, we will be doing ourselves a disservice. You know, the, the, the first invocation of, uh, of Article 5 was because of the attack on the United States that emanated from Afghanistan. And it was one of NATO's, I think, great achievements, what happened with the uh, destruction of uh, the Taliban regime and all the work that all NATO members did in Afghanistan in the succeeding 20 years. I think it's a tragic mistake that the U.S. and NATO withdrew from Afghanistan. And to me, it just highlights why this question of security, peace and security for the North Atlantic area can't be viewed in isolation. And so this upcoming summit, I think, uh, could be a forum not, not to resolve all the issues. I think that's not possible, but certainly to begin a more serious discussion than we've had to date, I think could be very important. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just necessarily agree with, with uh, Ambassador Porter. The very much uh, to uh, I want to re remember that in the, in the prior summit that we celebrated in Madrid, 1997, the first in the unique uh, summit <laughs> uh, so far in, uh, in, in Spain, we approved several important questions for us. Now, first of all, the presence of Spain in the military structure of, of NATO that uh, put uh, end a, a very strange uh, position of Spain in the organization. And uh, a second, uh, we approve as well the, uh, the first enlargement of NATO after the Cold War, the first enlargement for, in favor of Czechia, Hungary, and Poland. That then was confirmed for the summit in Washington. And then, and more, we approve the special relationship and the partnership between Ukraine and NATO. And this is important, Ricardo, yeah. because uh, this is begin as well in in a seminar in Madrid. But I, I, I share the ideas of of, of uh, um, Ambassador Bolton, and I consider that uh, Madrid was was um, decisive to extend NATO to Finland, to Sweden. That is very two important uh, countries, uh, new countries in the in the in the in the NATO. Consider the current situation in in, uh, in Ukraine. Define and confirm a clear strategy to defeat this initiative from Mr. Putin, this military initiative for, uh, for um, Russia, and establish the conditions in NATO that NATO is converted in a guarantee to eliminate any temptation in any country to intervene to, intervene, to invade other uh, countries and, and to broke the sovereignty and the um, integrity of these countries. For me, this is very important. Yeah, you are, you are both absolutely right, and I completely agree with you. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I, was, I was one of the negotiators of the Helsinki Final Act, and I remember very well that one of the principles, the main, the first principle, and that was, uh, you have to remember, but that was approved in 1975. The first principle introduced a, a, a principle which is very clear, is that uh, all the participating states, which certainly at the time included uh, of the 35 initial states and then all the others who joined later, have the right to belong to all the international agreements and have the right to belong or not to belong to treaties of alliance. This is one of the things that Russia is violating again, you know, against their own compromises. And, and uh, President Arnold is absolutely right, the 1997 uh, summit meeting in Madrid of the NATO was extremely important for us because, uh, he, as he pointed out, was the, the moment when we close the whole process of 
of integration into NATO through the military integration. That was uh, nothing, something which was not done before. We have to remember that thing. And at the same time, it uh, did introduce the possibility of all the former socialist members of the of the Warsaw Pact to be to become members of NATO, applying the same principle. Because after all, when the Russians are telling us that we are that NATO is attacking, is it is that uh, trying to attack uh, the, the the Soviet? Well, I wouldn't say the Soviet Union right now, but the Russian Federation is not true. It's basically not true. All those countries, like we did in the past, are looking for their own defense, their own defense of their own values and principles and democratic values. So, more or less, more, more, more even, uh, uh, Ambassador Perez, if you let me, in the in the next uh, summit in 1999, that there was in Washington. That this is the expression of anniversary of the, of the foundation of, 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 of NATO. In the meeting, in the summit, there is seated in the meeting five former members of the Politburo of the Soviet Union. You can come. <laughs> come. This, this is the question that uh, the Ambassador Bolton said prior. Okay. One question is that the, the, uh, the NATO have a strategy and decided the strategy to expand the borders of NATO until the, 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 the doors of or the, the borders of Russia. Another thing is the freedom of the country that is, hey, I like, I want to be a member of NATO. But in this summit in Washington, I share this table with my colleagues from my in the of the US, my colleagues, but five former members of the Politburo of the Soviet Union. It's totally false that the attitude of the United States, of the NATO, was to try to not incorporate, eliminate, or, 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 or force uh, to Russia, or threaten Russia or his uh, friends of Russia to, to as, a, as a threat, uh, or, or, or consider NATO uh, a, a very serious threat for them. It is, it is totally untrue. And this is, this is a part of history. Now, let me ask you something which is very much in today's uh, world worry, which is how are we going to reach a reasonable peace as far as the aggression, the Russian aggression against the Ukraine is concerned? How do you see the possibilities of uh, reaching a, what I would call and insist a reasonable peace, not any peace? We are not back to Chamberlain, we are not back to the Sudeten, we are not back to Hitler. So which are the, the rules, which are the principles that we should be following, that NATO should be following, that the NATO members should be following just to achieve a real peace for now and for the future? Ambassador, you have the floor. Well, one, one thing to consider is that uh, at the beginning of the Russian invasion, uh, it was uh, the very widely held view. Certainly it was the view of U.S. intelligence, which they briefed Congress on, that uh, Russian forces would take Kiev within a matter of days and the whole country within a matter of weeks. So it wasn't just the Russians who uh, underestimated uh, Ukraine's resolve or overestimated their own capabilities. Uh, and in those early days, the first, let's say, four, six, eight weeks of the war, uh, we and other NATO members were simply trying to get assistance to Ukraine to prevent defeat, to prevent the country from being overrun uh, through a variety of means. But, but now we can see that uh, uh, Russian capabilities are nothing like what we thought. Uh, the the war is is not at a stalemate yet, but it's marked by uh, very little uh, progress from the Russian side, which is, which is important. But I don't, I don't think collectively, I, I speak for the United States, certainly, I don't, I don't think the government has now a new set of objectives in mind, given these changed circumstances. People talk about victory very loosely. You know, it's the position of the United States and has been since, uh, since the 2014 invasion that Ukraine is entitled to full sovereignty over its territory uh, as it was created at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, do we really expect President Zelensky to give up some of that territory? 
I think he'd be hard pressed not to say he once ceded back to Ukraine uh, what was taken in 2014. So to me, this is a very difficult question. Uh, I don't I don't think Putin has any incentive to negotiate because he's got to do something to repair the reputational damage that the Russian military has suffered. So he has no incentive to negotiate. I don't think Zelensky has any incentive either. I find it hard, if not impossible, to believe that he would uh, that he would somehow find some piece of Ukraine he was willing to give to uh, to, to the Russians. So I think we've got to, to look very seriously about what NATO is prepared uh, to insist upon from Russia. And uh, we've come so far in such a relatively quick period of time, the military situation has evolved so quickly that I think many countries are not thinking in those terms. I don't think the United States is to start. So that's something we have to look at. When, when we talk about victory for, NATO, for, for Ukraine, we can certainly say, not being defeated, that, that was the easy part. But how, how do we define what comes next? And specifically, uh, are we willing simply to go back to the status quo antebellum before this latest invasion? I think the answer to that's clearly not, but how much more can we reasonably uh, expect to achieve? That, that is a key issue that leaders have to address. So would you consider that Putin should be brought to the international criminal court and and submitted to trial. Would you consider? Well, I'm not a the, fan of the, yeah. I'm not a fan of the international criminal court for a whole range of reasons. We could discuss that at a separate conference. It well, does would raise you, the question. Would you, in, in that particular case, would you consider the possibility of creating a new Nuremberg just to brought him to to bring him to trial? Well, I think the, the real answer to how to make Putin accountable uh, is, is a, a different kind of government in Russia. Uh, and, and real accountability, real responsibility would be the Russian people holding him to account for what he's done in their name. Now, I, I don't think we have collectively addressed what comes after Putin or whether that's possible. I think many people have had... Uh, uh, overly optimistic uh, ideas about the Russian people somehow uh, getting getting a new government. I, I don't see that in the near term. But but what are we as as NATO and particularly for those in uh, in Europe for the United States really on a global basis? Are, do we consider a post-war Russia led by Putin to be just an, another normal country? Are we just going to turn the page and go back to business as usual? I think some in both the United States and Europe want for business and commercial reasons. I just find that very hard to believe. Uh, so, so I think we all need to do some very serious thinking. I don't think the status quo antebellum uh, is acceptable, uh, but, but I, I also know there are many, especially in Europe, that uh, really don't see much beyond going back to that, to that period. Uh, so we better have this discussion now you have, before you can negotiate seriously, you have to know what your objectives are. And I don't think collectively we can say at this point we, we have an answer to that. President, yeah. now, how, uh, do you, how do you see it? No, I, 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 I understand the people uh, when, when they say Putin is a war criminal and must be uh, convicted and, and, and uh, subject to a trial in the international court. Well, but prior or, or prior of or, or, or all these questions, if you think this, you must to defeat Putin. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, organize another Nuremberg, you must to defeat the enemies. <laughs> because if not, it's impossible. And, and, and the question is how what means exactly defeated Putin? How means exactly? defeated this in strategic initiative, military, defeated mm, uh, totally the initiative of the uh, mi Russian military, trying to uh, put apart Putin on the leadership of the, of the of Russia leadership. What means this? I think I, I understand very clear what is the strategic defeat that we needed 
uh, in this uh, in this uh, crisis. I understand perfectly all the questions related with uh, territorial integrity. I understand perfect all the questions relating with allies uh, uh, unity that we must to preserve. I understand the necessity to witness seriously the military capabilities of uh, Russia. I understand perfectly the necessity of full <laughs> reinforced NATO. But the question, the, the question, the definition of, of, of the what means defeated Putin is uh, on the table. And I am sure the same people, well, well, can share the idea that it's uh, better that uh, that continue that uh, they continue in this situation to negotiate with Mr. Putin. If you are negotiating with Mr. Putin, all the consideration of uh, the of Mr. Putin that in the terms of the criminal court and so on, I think is uh, is uh, is part of uh, uh, another world. No? I think the war the war will be long, will be a long war. And, uh, and we must to win the, this war. Ukrainian must to win this war. And Ukrainian with us must to win this war. And, uh, and this means the strategic defeat of Mr. Putin. This is my answer until today. Are you considering or uh, thinking about the possibility of uh, further participation of the Western world, NATO, the United States, in the war, are you uh, considering the possibility that at some point or other we could end up in the Third World War? Are you considering the possibility, as Putin has mentioned several times, that nuclear war could be there? That uh, well, he's been threatening all of us. With. Do you uh, see that possibility as one of the possibilities in the near future? Or uh, do you see some sort of arrangement bringing uh, the war to an end and at the same time all those responsible for the war to some sort of responsibility? Because at the end of the day, we cannot sort of uh, imagine a world after Ukraine as if nothing had happened. Uh, how do you see these possibilities, right now? Well, I, I don't see, I don't really see a possibility uh, at this juncture of uh, Russia using nuclear weapons. I think, uh, I think Putin has been bluffing on this point. I think he's trying to deter us and he's had some measure of success, unfortunately. I don't, I don't think it's serious uh, uh, until Russia's in complete retreat out of Ukraine, possibly the Ukrainians moving toward the Russian border, uh, which would be a regime threatening circumstance for Putin himself. But I think we also need to understand how how deeply we're in this conflict already, not just the provision of weapons and ammunition, but the provision of intelligence that has materially assisted the Ukrainians in, in their efforts in a whole variety of fields. So if Putin wanted justification or a pretext for responding to NATO, as he sometimes talks about, you know, he, he's basically already got it. And I think that's why the Baltic Republics, Poland and others uh, are, are so worried and why uh, in, in, in the days in, in late uh, 2021, we should have taken this threat of a Russian invasion more seriously. Let's be clear, our greatest failure is that we failed to deter the invasion to begin with. So uh, if we want peace and security in Europe, you cannot allow countries to commit unprovoked aggression against their neighbors and escape essentially uh, into a world where you can turn the page and everybody forgets that it happened. We've made that mistake uh, too many times before. Uh, I, I find it hard to believe actual NATO military forces would be involved, uh, but, uh, but that's something we should be thinking about once hostilities cease. Uh, if Ukraine's not gonna become a NATO member, what are we gonna do to make sure that a future Putin doesn't decide he's got a better plan than Putin did, and we go through this all over again. Pressing out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in my view, in this moment, I think clearly that there is, there is no room for any kind of negotiation. 
but uh, and the race is the extension of the of the of the of the of the world. But uh, this race exists, but this possibility exists. And did you tell me maybe Ambassador Bolton in general has risen when the, he said that the threat from Putin to use a nuclear weapon is a bluff, maybe. Except in the case of an existential threat for Russia. In this case, my view, my personal view, is the possibility that use this nuclear uh, weapon exist. Exist. And, uh, and with the logical of Mr. Putin, implacable logical of Mr. Putin, this threat exists. And, uh, but we, 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 we should react and this possibility, not with panic, but very different than the beginning of this crisis. But I don't know if, if John Bolton is, is agree with me, but I, I understand that at the beginning of this crisis, we said Putin, guy, you non invade, no organized invasion of Ukraine. But if you invade Ukraine, our response will be establish sanctions, sanctions against you, but not confronting, directed with you. And Putin made his calculus and said, okay, I organized the invasion. This was a mistake that with us improving the situation of the commitment of NATO and we help Ukrainians. No? And this is one of the reasons because I think that Mr. Putin thought in the moment that uh, his presence in, in Kiev in 48 hours changed the regime in his favor. But this possibility exists. And, the, and the, I mean, the response of the NATO on one of the recent important uh, questions in the, in, the, in the Madrid summit will be establish a clear response of any threat of use uh, uh, nuclear weapons um, for Mr. Putin. Establish a clear threat, a be a clear strategy, a clear response to 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 this uh, to this uh, threat. Because if not, the the, the 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 combination can be the the the, the same as the beginning of the crisis. Well, this guy, this uh, the Western countries, the NATO, talking and talking and talking, said a lot of, of things, but finally don't respond to this. Well, this consideration must be in the table of the of the summit in Madrid, maybe. Um, well, uh, both of your friends, Jose Maria, uh, John, we've uh, reached the time we have originally allotted to ourselves. But I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that we have the right and ob almost the obligation to say a few words. And I would like you to, I would like to listen from you, your uh, remarks in that respect. Certainly, this is a conversation we should be going on and on and on, because after all, we, we are talking is the peace in the world and the rights of the people to live freely in peace. Uh, and uh, we might eventually think through FIS and through Jose Maria and have the, the continuation of this conversation. But for the time being, I would like to invite you, both of you, to say a final uh, remarks on this uh, today's dialogue. John. Well, I, I would say I'm very optimistic. Uh, you know, it's a time of tragedy in Ukraine because of the Russian aggression, but it, it's, uh, I think, in the history of nations, typically when you confront great challenges that uh, opportunities flow from them, and it reminds people what our basic values are, and certainly in the case of NATO, it reminds us why we banded together in, in the first place and, uh, and, and why bringing new members in shows the, the continued importance of the organization. So uh, despite the, the breadth of the challenges we face around the world, uh, I think it's this kind of uh, uh, adrenaline uh, that, uh, that gives us uh, confidence that we can respond, we can respond effectively, and, and we can create uh, circumstances that deter our adversaries from, from beginning future wars to begin with. 
Jose Maria Aznar. Uh, I, I personally believe in the formidable uh, power of freedom, and the power of freedom is uh, is uh, has been in the history of the world the most important tool in uh, in, in our hands, and uh, I think that uh, finally this power of freedom will going to prevail as well in this crisis. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to you both. Uh, it was uh, uh, very fantastic to, to listen to both of you. And uh, at the same time, there are really quite a number of foods for thought in what we've been discussing. I would like to end up saying it's at the end of the day, uh, I would like to I would like to, to recover some sense of the universal organization that used to be the United Nations, just to prevent mankind from the threat from the from the threat of war. But certainly we are looking and we are watching right now uh, difficult moments. And uh, as John Bolton pointed out, I'm still uh, an optimistic in spite of everything. Thank you very much to you both. It's been such a pleasure on behalf of myself, on behalf of FIRES, Foundation, on behalf of the president of this wonderful foundation for us, who is uh, today with us, Jose Maria Adnar. And thank you, thank you to you all who both from the side, from both sides of the Atlantic have been following this wonderful dialogue. Goodbye now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ambassador. Thank you very much.